Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Jack Spraga, and it's my uh, honor and privilege to serve as president at uh, uh, Bristol Community College, and I welcome you to this very important uh, uh, public session. Um, <clears throat> you might want to know a few things about uh, the work that we've been doing uh, in this field, uh, the general field of uh, sustainability. Um, I am a uh, founding signatory on behalf of the college in a uh, American College and University President's Climate Commitment. And uh, we have an organization across the country of uh, uh, presidents who have uh, committed and pledged to meet certain standards in a progressive way so that we're uh, carbon neutral at the college by uh, 2020. Uh, so uh, we have quite an ambitious agenda in front of us inside the college, and we're working very hard uh, to do that, and we've made some uh, wonderful strides uh, in this regard. Uh, we have a sustainability committee uh, which establishes goals annually uh, for the college. Uh, I also awarded a presidential fellowship to a, a faculty member, uh, Professor uh, Nancy Lee Wood, who uh, through her great leadership, uh, we have organized and created an institute for uh, sustainability and post-carbon education. And that institute is not only working inside the college to help us with our uh, sustainability conservation methods, but also uh, public and community education as well. Uh, several uh, of our uh, most notable accomplishments uh, here at the college include a, um, a both a 100,000 kilowatt and a, a 100 kilowatt and a 10 kilowatt uh, photovoltaic uh, arrays that were installed uh, to provide academic opportunities at the college. Uh, you may have noticed photovoltaic uh, cells on our, uh, some of our roofs, and we're going to continue with that as well. We completed a $4.9 million energy and uh, water conservation improvement project uh, to uh, realize a 47% annual reduction in, uh, waste wa in uh, water consumption and 24% reduction in building energy consumption. So we've made significant strides uh, in this field. A welcome center, you may have noticed uh, as you walked in uh, off the lobby, a welcome center was recently uh, developed and created at the college, and it has uh, used a good uh, number of uh, uh, non-toxic building finishes. Uh, the, uh, the floor uh, in the welcome center is made up of recycled uh, tires, and uh, countertops are uh, recycled glass bottles and uh, uh, waste products that have been put together and make this shiny, nice uh, uh, countertop. I urge you to look at it as you're on your way out. Uh, the wood has been uh, uh, taken only from uh, approved, if you will, sustainability uh, 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 sources. Uh, we also completed a grant-funded wind turbine feasibility study, uh, and that is the uh, su subject of our conversation tonight, of course. We have standardized sustainable roof systems that were installed across the campus. And BCC has um, implemented uh, several policies related to reducing its environmental footprint, including an energy conservation policy, an energy star purchasing policy, anti-idling policy, a ban on uh, incandescent um, light bulbs, a mass rides bronze level partner. We're a partner in mass rides at the bronze level. Uh, we've also put together a, a smoke-free uh, college, uh, not just at the Fall River campus, but throughout, uh, Fall, uh, throughout New Bedford, Attleboro, and uh, Taunton as well, smoke-free. Um, we created the institute, as I spoke about, and uh, uh, is dwelling a good deal of the focus on the institute is on peak oil and uh, the post-carbon needs that we're going to have once we've reduced, we, the world, have reduced the, uh, the uh, fundamental pools, if you will, the reservoirs and resources of oil uh, that are finite uh, on our globe. We have an organic agriculture program which aims to certify uh, organic agricultural technicians uh, uh, with a certificate program, academic program here at the college. 
The marine technology curriculum includes a successful and continuing Quahog uh, project, which has been funded by the National Science Foundation SMART grant. Also, the National Science Foundation Sustainability and Green Energy uh, Department or funds have uh, come across the curriculum project, and we're building a regional capacity to train the next generation of engineering technicians to apply principles of sustainability, including renewable, efficient, and clean energy production in a range of technical careers. Bristol Community College has joined partnership with Cape Cod Community College and Massaso in, uh, on the Cape, obviously, and Massachusetts, uh, I'm sorry, Massasoit Community College in Brockton. And we're collaborating on a green energy design and building project in, uh, as we partner with green businesses and regional high schools. We also have a green center that you may have uh, read about in, uh, on Duval Street. Uh, in which we do weatherization training, and we have both credit and non-credit activities at that green center. Uh, it needs to be off campus because the, uh, the ceilings need to be a lot higher so that the equipment that comes in, the weatherization equipment, uh, can fit. Uh, uh, so uh, without maximum uh, uh, renovations here on this campus. We implemented a green print policy, which is a print management designed to raise awareness. We are using a lot of double-sided printing now and reducing the number of printers in the offices. Uh, uh, and that has saved nearly 70,000 sheets of paper in the first year, an equivalent of 6,500 gallons of wastewater and 500, almost 600 more pounds of solid waste. So the uh, uh, the uh, sustainability efforts are uh, really uh, making a significant difference here at the college. The Boston Globe in, uh, has written a constellation kudos to, uh, uh, to Bristol Community College uh, for, our, uh, for our efforts. And I think uh, we have won the, uh, uh, is the only community college in New England to have won uh, awards uh, for our efforts. Uh, also, the uh, college has a climate action plan. Uh, as we move forward uh, to making this commitment to become carbon neutral. Uh, the college and I, as I mentioned, are a signatory. This is, I'm also uh, uh, for this uh, American, American co College and University President's um, Pledge and the climate uh, commitment that we have made. And I am on the executive committee, the National Executive Committee, as we move forward uh, with this and making a significant difference. You know, the role of a community college uh, and of higher education has always been in our history uh, a, a role of uh, being a resource for the community, uh, for the country. If you needed a big project done, scientific research, engineering, whatever it was, uh, people turn to higher education to provide those uh, responses, whether it's a community college or a major postdoctorate -grad post graduate program. Uh, as, as thorny issues arise in front of the nation's agenda. And so we're very proud of this role as a community service, if you will. But the second dimension on our uh, efforts here is to uh, really show by example, to take care of our own inside the college uh, uh, and take care of our own matters so that you can see uh, a model uh, for sustainability, for conservation, for energy savings. And that is very uh, much a, uh, a source of pride for us at Bristol Community College. So there's two roles for uh, higher education in general, and that is out in the community uh, to help solve problems, but also to model uh, appropriate behavior in various areas. And for tonight, I'd like to focus on, uh, on our sustainability efforts. Well, we, uh, we need to move on and uh, open the... Uh, open the forum uh, with uh, some of our distinguished guests. I want to first, just for a few seconds, I wanted to acknowledge the presence of someone from the uh, DCAM, do you know that term? Uh, Capital Asset Management uh, Division uh, from, uh, from Boston, you know, all the way down from the Holy City, is uh, Tony Ransom, and Tony is just gonna say hello so you know who he is, uh, and he will be a resource for us during our discussion tonight. Mr. Tony Ransom. Good evening, all, and I'd like to thank you for your interest in this project. As uh, Dr. Springer said, I am uh, a member of DCAM's Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Buildings Group. Uh, I am actually the program manager for all energy efficiency projects 
at all of our state's higher uh, learning institutions. I brought with me uh, my program, my project manager for this job, Tony Dover, and he will be handling this job. Uh, basically, one of our, our main job of my group at uh, DCAM is to help implement the governor's executive order 484. And this order mandates that all government buildings, I, I believe uh, there are about 50 million square feet of state-owned buildings, uh, reduce their energy and water consumption over a 20 to 30 year period. We have our first milestones due at the end of next year in reducing the use of energy and water in all of our buildings. And that's one of our basic mandates to do that. Uh, DCAM has done some review of uh, the study for this project. We will be uh, becoming very much involved with it. We will be coordinating it, basically managing it through construction. Uh, we will also be providing the financing by which the project is done through a special bond fund that the governor has created for us to work with to do our energy efficiency projects. Uh, we'll discuss that probably a little later when we have a question and answer period. I think some people have some questions regarding how it is funded, and I think we'll wait to after the presentation to answer those questions during that period. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, and welcome, Tony. You don't have to be named Tony to work at DCAM, do you? Or thank you very much for coming. Um, now it's my honor to uh, introduce to you uh, a senior project manager, jo Jonathan Markey, um, who will uh, uh, explain uh, some of the situation for you uh, tonight. Some of you know more than others about uh, what's going on. Um, uh, Jonathan has his uh, uh, Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of uh, Low Massachusetts at Lowell. He's a registered professional engineer in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, as well as a certified Title V system inspector for Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Markey is presently responsible for managing feasibility and design consul consultation services for renewable energy projects offering broad knowledge in finance, alternative energy technologies, and environmental impact mitigation. In addition, he brings experience from civil site design for residential and commercial properties, uh, and we're very happy to have him with us. He's worked on numerous wind turbine projects in all phases, from conception to planning to feasibility and permitting process to final construction. So uh, it's my honor to introduce to you uh, Jonathan Markey. Please welcome uh, Jonathan as he begins our forum tonight. Thanks, Jack. <clears throat> uh, my name is Jonathan Markey. I'm a senior project manager at uh, Meridian Associates. Um, at Meridian Associates, we are civil engineers and land surveyors. Uh, we do 3D laser scanning. Obviously, we do renewable energy and uh, landscape architecture. Um, my involvement with this mid-sized commercial scale wind turbine project uh, began about a year and a half ago. Um, it started from a grant that was issued through the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Uh, for a $65,000 feasibility study. Uh, feasibility study and impact analysis was then performed on the property, which included uh, wind data collection. If you remember driving by, you saw the, the big Met Tower. I have some pictures of that. Um, the power projections from the collected wind data, a financial pro forma to determine whether a, a, a mid-sized commercial scale turbine project would work at this location. And uh, impact analyses, uh, which included uh, bird and bat evaluations, air traffic impacts, electromagnetic and uh, TV interference studies, a flicker analysis, uh, visual aesthetic considerations, which is a photo montage, and audible noise considerations. Um, this is what a, uh, a MET tower looks like when it's delivered to the site. Uh, then we put this whole thing together because what we're looking to do is measure wind at the site and correlate it to a known point to determine a 20-year projection of the 
uh, of the wind resource at a particular site. So this is what it looks like when it's going up. And there it is all plumbed up. As you can see at the top, there's three sets of redundant anemometers which collect wind data for a one-year period. Um, the, the three different elevations determine the wind shear at the site. Wind shear is uh, the change in wind speed relative to elevation. So we take this data and we come up with a, a couple different types of graphs. Um, one is uh, the on the left-hand side at the top, this is a wind rose. This tells you your wind speed densities from different directions and uh, how much power you typically make from any given direction. Uh, we also then run it through a, a uh, frequency distribution where we take the wind speeds and we find out what percentage of the time does the wind blow at different speeds. And that's the chart right here. We then multiply this chart by this chart, which is a power curve, which are given by the, um, the turbine manufacturers. And we can come up with an annual percentage uh, of, well, the, uh, an annual production for any given turbine. So we were trying to find a turbine that meets some certain criteria. We wanted to minimize the effects on abutting properties to the college. We wanted to find a turbine that would produce around 25% of what the school uses for power. And uh, we wanted to find a responsible size for, uh, for the location of the campus and the neighborhoods. And what we came up with, uh, the best size that fit all these criteria is a 900 kilowatt direct drive turbine manufactured by EWT. So this proposed turbine uh, is, will be mounted on a 75 meter hub, which is about 240 feet tall. The total height to the blade at the 12 o'clock position will be about 334 feet. Uh, the average wind speed for the site was 6.04 meters per second, which will yield a production of about 1.5 gigawatt hours per year which will save the college about $250,000 a year. And that's avoided cost for purchasing electricity. Uh, it also includes the sale of uh, renewable energy credits. Um, let me explain renewable energy credits for a minute. Uh, RECs, or renewable energy credits, are the green attribute associated with every kilowatt hour of generated electricity from a renewable resource. Uh, they are a commodity because of the compliance market with the renewable portfolio standards. A couple of years ago, um, Massachusetts wrote legislation which mandates that uh, a certain percentage of um, distributed power from utilities be from renewable resources. Now, Companies like National Grid and, and NSTAR could go out and, and produce their own renewable resources or they can purchase the green attributes from projects like this, which is what they do. They, they make these, they purchase these wrecks, their revenue to the, to the person who owns the turbine. So where are we planning on uh, installing this turbine? Um, better than the plan, I can actually show you outside. If you look at the guy standing on the shore, you see him across the shore? Okay, about, uh, about 50 feet to the right of him. Yeah. Let's all give him a round of applause, thank you. Um, yeah, so about 50 feet to the right of that, off the, off the hill back there. If you've ever walked back there, it's, it's really nice out there. There's a, there's a nice grassy knoll in, in the back of him. Over to the right of him is, uh, is a nice leveled off area, and that's where we'd be planning on uh, placing the turbine. How high about the trees? Those trees, 
I'm looking probably about uh, probably about 60 feet tall. So the the top of the blade of the turbine. Uh, where are we here? 330 feet. So 247. Yeah. So uh, yeah, around. Uh, 180 feet higher than the trees. Three times higher than those trees. Um, three, yeah. Three, so it's six. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing those trees are about 60 feet tall. So our impact analysis of uh, avian mortality rates, um, typically a turbine located in an area such as this will yield um, what's estimated to be one death per year or one collision per year. Um, as, by way of comparison, here are some um, annual uh, collisions. That, and these are taken right from a USDA report. Um, so if, if we look at a chart, we can see turbines are pretty minimal impact for bat and avian um, when properly placed. I know there are studies out there about Adamont Pass with the bats. Um, we're not in a, in a migratory um, pathway, which, was, uh, which is what's happening at, in California. We also look at air traffic impacts. Uh, we evaluate the proximity to airports, uh, the proposed height of the turbine um, for potential impacts. Um, Massachusetts Aviation Commission, or MAC, found no hazard to air navigation, and we also filed with the uh, FAA, and they also found no hazard for air navigation. Electromagnetic and TV interference, uh, we found that there would be no adverse effects uh, to existing antennas, uh, no adverse effects to directional microwave, and no adverse effects to uh, Department of Defense uh, radar. We also ran a flicker analysis. Flicker is the phenomena that you experience when the turbine is between you and the sun, and the blades passing by the sun actually blink out the lights will blink out the, the sunlight. Um, commercial scale turbines run around 20 RPMs, which would relate to a blinking of one hertz, or one blink per second. Um, it can be mitigated by, um, by plantings. It can be mit mitigated by simply shutting the shades. It can be mitigated by shutting the turbine down for for uh, the times of the year and the time of the day that it actually occurs. There's been a, um, there's a, uh, there's a non-written protocol of 30 hours per year uh, for, uh, it's basically your goal. You, you don't want to exceed 30 hours per year. Um, the two areas of impact which are out at the, the corner right out here are between zero and nine hours per year and 16 hours per year. Um, the chart at the right hand side tells you the time of day and the months of the year that you would experience this phenomena. Um, and having this information, it's, uh, it's good because if, if this does become a problem, the turbine can be shut down, and it can be programmed to shut down during these times with the photo eye sensor. So if I can just uh, kind of explain. I, I'm going to walk up there a little bit. What this chart shows is uh, on this scale is the time of the day, and on this scale is the month and, and day of the year. So if we chose to look at... Uh, Location H, which is this brown area. Location H is right here. Uh, you would experience flicker between the hours of uh, 
I think that says 6.30 and it's 7 o'clock between the months of Um, so just to repeat, uh, if we want to look at the flicker impacts at location H, which is located at the intersection, uh, right out there. Yes. Um, we could expect to see it between, uh, sometime in March, April, May, June, that's July, that's August, March and August from I think that's a 6.30 and 7 o'clock in the morning. Now, taking, the, taking this into consideration, we can put this back up. I'm gonna. Taking this into consideration, the summer months are actually the, uh, are the lowest production months for turbines. So most of the time that occurs in that area, the turbine actually won't be running. Um, I think it's important to note that the wind resource at this site, although it does make the project economically feasible, it's at the very threshold of um, where developers would say yes or no. This has 6.02 meters per second. Typically, a wind project of six meters per second or less well, well, less than, not six meters or less, but less than six meters per second is not an economically feasible project. What I'm trying to get at is this project has a capacity factor of 20%. Most of the time you're gonna drive by this turbine, it's not gonna be running. That doesn't mean that it's not economically feasible. It means that it's in a wind regime that does yield favorable results, but it yields them during the time of the year that the, that the college uses the most amount of power in the winter. So typically in the summer, we're going to see that most of the time the turbine isn't running, um, but we're getting the bang for our buck out of the months that have the, uh, the best wind resource. <clears throat> so we also ran uh, photomontage which is a, uh, we go out, we take pictures, we put the pictures uh, into the, this program, which uh, plots the turbine location on the picture that we took. Uh, this is the view taken from the intersection of Ray Street and Stanley Street. The turbine won't be red, but I, I, if I made it white in the program, you can't see it, so I chose red. This would be the view from um, the overpass at uh, Meridian Street over Route 24. And let me see what. It's right there. Again, I made it red, but you can't even see it in that one. So. Um, this was taken from the end of Spruce Street, um, but it's actually not visible from this location. And uh, actually don't, I don't have a location written for this one in my report, so I can't tell you where that is right now. Um, in addition to these analyses, we also ran um, acoustic analyses. Uh, Dr. Howard Quinn is, uh, is going to come up and talk to you about that. Um, he, he did, uh, come on up, Howard. Yeah. And he'll explain what he did in his analysis. Uh, right, we did a, a, noise, a noise analysis for the uh, proposed turbine here, um, and basically it consisted of about uh, two or three uh, different parts. We did uh, some noise monitoring to see what the background levels were near the, the 
near the college. Uh, we monitored a couple locations uh, near College Heights where the closest residents were. And we also monitored the location, the typical ones, which would be across Route 24 to see what the sound levels were. And we found that um, it was actually a, a typical, it's a quiet suburban neighborhood, but not quieter than ones I've seen before. Pretty typical, 30 to 32 decibels. So we then went ahead and took a look at some turbines uh, to see uh, what turbines would fit into the location. Originally, about a year ago, the folks at Meridian and the college were interested in putting in a 1.5 megawatt turbine. And we modeled that and kept giving the sound levels. And we concluded that the sound levels from a 1.5 uh, turbine was going to be a little too loud. We, you know, it, it, we thought, you know, maybe most people would like it, but there was a reasonable chance that some people wouldn't. And we also thought there was also a possibility it would not be in, uh, it would be in violation of the Massachusetts DEP regulations. So we uh, took a look, another look at another turbine, a smaller one, the 900 kilowatt turbine, which he's described. And we took a look at it and discovered that that one gave us sound levels which were a bit lower and they were pretty close to being acceptable at most of the residents. And we concluded that under most conditions they would be, uh, but we felt there was a possibility that late at night when the wind was blowing towards some of the residents that the, there might still be some issues. We couldn't be sure, but we wanted to be conservative about it. So we went ahead and studied the possibility of turning the turbines off late at night when the wind was blowing towards the residents, the closest ones at College Heights. And what we concluded was that it wouldn't uh, gr greatly affect the power production from the turbine. They would lose around 5% of their power if they turned them off late at night. So we thought, you know, for, for, for a slight 5% reduction of power, they could get, you know, that they would design a project that would be much uh, better received by the local residents. So that was what we did, and so uh, we, those were these bit, real quickly describing the, the sound levels we predicted for the turbines. Uh, I don't know if people here are familiar with sound levels. These are decibel levels, uh, but the decibel scale goes from around, you know, the sound levels you can hear about 20 decibels to about like 120, which is a rock concert. Uh, the sound levels hearing here would be around the 40 to 41 decibel level, which are levels typical of, of suburban neighborhoods. Um, and, the, and under most circumstances, they're not usually considered uh, annoying. However, wind turbine sound has the problem that unlike sound like, say, for Route 24, which you tend to get used to, is it goes up and down constantly. So it's, it's considered more noticeable. So we have to have, when we do permitting for wind turbines, we have to adjust sound levels downward to uh, uh, to reflect the fact that people notice the, the wind turbine sound more readily than they do other kinds of sounds. So the kind of levels that we try to aim for, the ones we got at College Heights, uh, which is 41 to 42 decibels in the worst case. And this is without the shutdown uh, uh, procedures. And then on the crosswind, if the wind was blowing from the side, it would be about 40, 41 decibels. And then if you're upwind, which the turbine, the, the residents will be uh, for a significant portion of the time, the turbines are, are operating, the levels will be much lower, 30, uh, 38, maybe 39 decibels, probably lower than that. And in fact, the levels we have here are considered, are actually conservative, very conservative. We added two decibels to so the noisiest possible levels from the turbines that the manufacturers gave us. And we assume that the turbines are running, you know, this is the, the noisiest possible situation you could get. So we've been very conservative in our modeling and try to adjust, you know, things to reflect the possibilities that, you know, some turbines may be a little louder or the turbines may, may get a little louder as they get older. So we put all that in and we've been very conservative about our modeling and we believe uh, the upshot of it is by, you know, using a smaller turbine than the one they originally had wanted to permit by, uh, uh, you know, being conservative about our, our uh, sound estimates to make sure that we, there was no chance of it going over anything we said. And by turning the turbine down late at night for, for the residents who are downwind, we believe we designed a project which we think that, you know, most people living near the turbine should find acceptable. College Heights is, you go out there, it's right across over the... 
you know, houses right over, those are the closest ones. There were some people on the other side of Route 24, and they would, uh, they would hear them. That would have been the closest residence to east would be 35. But as it turns out, that the sound from Route 24 is loud enough to where it's going to, they'll probably hear it sometimes, but it's not going to be, it's going to be on the same level as the highway. It's going to be really hard to hear it over the highway. Now, there's a background noise that comes from the college 24 hours. It's not all that much. You Most of, you can hear it. Yeah. And I don't know if it's the air conditioning system or what, but it goes on all the time. That's right. I'm just wondering what, what decibels that is that Well, the, the answer is, well, can we go back real quick to the earlier about the, 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 the quietest background, that's when we recorded that. We went out during the, during the middle of the winter when there were no leaves on the trees and it was low wind conditions. We tried to, you know, conservative about our monitoring too. And whatever it was that was produced by the university at College Heights, we heard that. That was in there. What we actually found out was that the sound levels here are controlled it, most of the time, I'd say about, you know, three quarters of the day, Route 24 creates most of the sound. It's only late at night that the other effects start becoming really more noticeable. So what, what's the comparison in the decibel levels with the background noise as opposed to the, the sound that would be generated from the... Well, here, uh, go back to the, the, the background here is 30 to 32, all right? The, the turbine, the very worst case, would be 41 to 42. What's the comparison to that, though? Like it's about 10 decibels. Well, 40... Well, 40 decibels is basically about what, you, it, let's put it this way, if you walk down College Heights during the middle of the day, a typical suburban neighborhood, that's what you're going to hear during the day from just cars, uh, you know, dogs barking, any, any kind of sound that's in the background of a typical suburban neighborhood, during the middle of the day, it's going to be in the low to mid-40s. Most people in a typical suburban neighborhood are working during the day, so they're not so much affected by the sound, so now we're going to have the sound in the evening? Uh, that's correct. There would be sound in the evening, but uh, but during the evening, as it turns out, the sound from Route 24 is actually just about as loud as the sound you can hear from the turbines. The, the, I, I was actually surprised how loud the air, this area was most of the time, except late at night. If, if we looked at the data, I actually have the, have them with me. You can, I can discuss it with you afterwards and show it to you. Uh, we found that the, the, basically the sound from Route 24, you know, was almost as loud as anything else, like most of the day. It's only between the hours of about uh, 11 p.m. and about 4 to 5 a.m. that it goes down. The traffic levels go down to where other things start becoming more noticeable. But otherwise, 24 controls most of the sound levels the rest of the day. And that would be including the evening and in, in, the, in the morning. So when the turbines would be on, they would not be much louder than what you're hearing from Route 24, if that. That's well during. The, well, actually, it turns out that during the day when you would uh, at night. That's right, and that's when during the during the evening. No, the traffic on 24 is going to be pretty much a constant level too. And the only time you start hearing individuals, I made a lot of traffic studies, by the way, noise studies. The only time you hear individual uh, cars, you start hearing them is late at night, and that's when the local effects start predominating. And Route 24 does not drown out the sound late at night, and that's the, when we got the turn offs turned on. Yes. No, it's, it's about, it's, the increase in noise is about the very worst case, which is if you're directly downwind from the turbines and it's blowing as hard and, it's, and the wind's blowing at about seven or eight meters per second, the worst possible case that we modeled would be about nine to 10 decibels. But that was with two decibels added to make sure that we, that was two decibels more than the worst case the manufacturer gave us. We put two more decibels on top of that to make sure that we complied with the mass DEP regulations. Yes, sir. The other site you had picked up, why didn't you pick that one there behind the school, away from them? Uh, I don't know. I, I wasn't familiar with that. Is it because it would interfere with the school buildings, the noise? I, I, Jonathan would have to answer that question. I, I, I was never even formed there. They considered another site, so I, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm wrong here, but I thought you did pick them in two sites available. Uh, no, there's only one site available, and, and it's this one. The reason the I'm Met Tower was installed over there, but there's not enough room to install the, the turbine over there, just with property lines. We have to keep it within our property.
Go ahead. Excuse me. Um, the sound that you would hear from the turbine is pretty much equivalent to what you already hear from the road. And typically, if you're also home during the weekends, you would hear that road sound, and that's about what you would hear. Now, in the evenings, only certain times of the year, and I remember they were showing that the threshold of hours, 30 hours of actually, you know, flicker or what have you, if you think of it this way, the turbines don't spin 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year because of how the winds work. And so for a number of times, the turbines will not be even spinning. Typically, we try to gauge these turbines at running uh, 20 to 50% of the actual time of the year. Now, in a year, you're basically talking about 8,600 hours. So in effect, these are going to be running maybe 3,000 hours a year, max. And in the evening, when we have the highest, uh, I guess during the winter time is when we have the turbine spinning the most. And we've already talked about in the evening hours where the sound decreases because there's less traffic on the highway, we've already set it up so the turbines can also be turned off. So you wouldn't be hearing that noise late in the evening hours when you're trying to sleep. So we've tried to take that into effect so that we don't change your environment very much as far as the noise that you will be hearing from the turbine. It either blends in with the noise you're already hearing, and at those hours when that noise decreases during the winter months, we will also be looking at turning the turbine off so you don't hear the turbine at all late at night. And we also, by the way, to, to clarify that, we also but plan to turn it off during the summer months late at night too to be conservative about it because even during the summer, the noise is usually louder from insects and leaves rustling, but nonetheless, the fact that there would the, 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 the sound from Highway 24 would not be much greater during the winter and the summer, we felt to be conservative about it, we'd go ahead and turn it off late at night during the summer too. That was part of the analysis to make sure that we, you know, we covered both times. You're under You know, actually, I, I don't know whether they're going to do that, but I will state that there have been projects where they've been willing to do that. I don't think this is one project that would really be necessary, but it has been done before. It's not out of the question. Uh, if I may comment again, um, the wind turbine, because of its noise level, is going to be pretty much what you're already hearing. We're not going to increase that level. It'll be, it's going to run about the same that you typically hear now. So it won't be the road which is close to what you're already hearing from the university, plus the wind turbine on top of that. Everything is actually going to be pretty much at the level you're currently hearing now. We're, not in, we're barely increasing anything. You won't, no, I think, really notice a difference. And in those hours where we think you might notice it, we have plans to turn it off. I think you were saying that we were looking at uh, these, this turbine actually spending 20% of the year and still being financially feasible. So that really cuts the hours down to maybe instead of 8,000 or 9,000 hours a year that it spends, you actually may be going to hear it 1,200 hours. So that's a great decrease from the actual number of hours per year that in a heavy wind zone it could spend at 24 hours a day. So we will be doing our best in how we program it not to increase the noise levels that you currently hear and to not disturb your sleep by cutting it off at night time. I'm afraid uh, well, that would not be, like to see we're, that. we're not like next yeah. to being the, at the airport where we can, uh, monies from the state could take care of such an issue. Uh, we have a different scenario here. We do have the buffer of the trees and the distance that helps that situation. So we're, we're trying to take that to the fact because we don't want to disturb the neighborhood in order to save energy, we try to blend with the neighborhood and try to pick a turbine that doesn't make your life uh, any different than it already is. Real estate, are you going to talk about real estate values of homes um, with a 
I'll get this. Yeah, um, actually, if you if you want to know, this is a, currently a great topic of research and controversy. Um, and basically, I've, I've looked into this a bit myself because it's, you know, it's what I do. And the, the, re, the answer, to, the short answer is that there may be some effect at, at near distances. Uh, but the problem is that people haven't done the statistical analysis yet. The, the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory actually did an earlier analysis of homes, like about, you know, within, like well, once you're beyond about a half a mile radius of most wind turbines, there's not much effect at all. But they haven't looked at the very closer residents. They haven't broken it down, you know, to look exactly at sound issues and residents closer in. So there's a possibility that at some locations there, that, they, that, that actually may happen, but we don't think it's likely to be much of an effect here. Yes. How similar are, are the turbines that you're going to put here to the ones in Portsmouth? And what's the feedback from the people around there? Uh, the one in Portsmouth is, I recall, a 1.5. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, it's 1.5. So this is about two thirds the size of that, 60% of the size of that. So it's not obviously as big. I think the Portsmouth turbine is some, uh, there are located parts of it are lo closer to some of the residents. But I have not heard any great. Uh, controversies from Portsmouth or any great uh, people, you know, people saying anything bad about it. Yeah, that's a much larger turbine. It was yeah. the size that we decided we couldn't put here, number one. Yeah, so we, we, so we, we lowered the size of the turbine, which lowered its height and also lowered the noise level. Yeah. So we couldn't do one that size. We wouldn't have been allowed to do that by state regulations yeah, yeah, or by how it would affect your community. Okay. There's not the one at the Abbey. We're talking about the one at the high school. Hi, Abby's a 660, is that right, I think? Yep. Yeah, that's right. I've seen that one, too. So it's bigger than the one at the Abbey? No, the one here is smaller than the one at the Abbey. It's bigger, no, it's bigger than the one at the Abbey, smaller than the one at the high school, my mistake. Uh, question in the back. You've had your hand up for a while. Though we, though we haven't uh, opened the question and answer, I have this mic available so everyone can hear the questions and the answers. No. But I, I think that part of the reason that our, our houses, I feel, are worth more because of their location right now. And if this is going to diminish that, well, that's not good. Well, what actually the value of the I'm a real estate agent. Yeah. If, we, if, we, if, we, if we were able to get back to the electricity from this house. Your client list will be decreased by 50%. Uh, actually, I think that's pretty extreme. I don't believe the statistics anywhere point would substantiate that. Oh, that's possible, but the, the actual amount you pay would not, they would pay would not go down 50%. Just out of curiosity, how many of you live near wind turbines? One? Out of all of you? How far? I live in Newburyport. I live right near the Mark Ritchie 660. Why do we have that such a big one? Why can't we have a, we did, we did well, let, me, let me talk about the. You want to take this? So let, let me just talk about the um, the technology that we've chosen for for this site. I can answer sound questions a little later once he finishes the presentation. Okay. Um, the technology that we've chosen for this site. Uh, again, we're trying to be responsible for the location, for what's going to be, you know, responsible for size and for abutting impacts. The turbine we chose is actually one of the quietest available because it's a direct drive machine, which means it doesn't have a gearbox. Um, typically, a turbine is comprised of blades and a cell, which actually articulate the blades. It goes into a giant bearing. It goes into a two-speed gearbox, and then it goes to the generator in the back. And the gearbox is there to actually run the turbine at two different speeds to take advantage of the low wind speeds and the high wind speeds. This turbine has no gearbox, which is a generator of noise. Um, this turbine actually goes from the blades, it goes to a shaft, 
to a bearing and then the generator and one bearing on the end. It's got two less bearings, it's got less moving parts, and it's a lot quieter than a typical turbine. The values that Howard had add, added to the manufacturer's certified uh, noise levels is our attempt at being conservative in, in telling you this would actually be the very worst case that you could ever imagine. It will not be anywhere near what these reported values are. So, you know, saying that, you know, we're going to be able to hear it over Route 24 and, and things, I would really implore you, please go and take a look at these turbines that are of similar size when they're running. Stand underneath them, stand a thousand feet from them, try to hear them. They are very quiet. They, they really are. Um, I, I've lived in Newburyport since they put that turbine up, and uh, I stand underneath it. I can't hear it. I, well, I can hear it. When you block your ear from the wind and you really concentrate, you can hear it. Um, but they really are, they, they're not as loud as people are saying they are. And here's another thing. There are two different types of technologies. The blades are actually, con uh, the blades actually make noise as they pass through the air. And there's two types of turbines out there. There's pitch regulated and there's stall regulated. Pitch regulated means that the turbine blades turn and they take advantage of the, of the wind passing through them and it uses as much wind as it possibly can. And that regulates the speed at which the generator is going to turn. A stall regulated turbine actually feathers the blades so that it slows itself down to meet that revolution per minute. It overspeeds itself and it slows itself down with its blades. That makes noise. This is not that type of turbine. This is a pitch regulated turbine. Um, okay, uh, more questions. Sorry. You talked about, talk about the noise from the turbine itself, or there the, are two generators. The noise from noise. the blade making the whoosh sound. Woof. Woof. Right. Uh, what, uh, there's decibels. What are you talking about here? They're both. The oh. decibels that are up there are from, are from both generators of noise. It's from the blades and from the mechanical com components inside the turbine. There you go, sir. Thank you. You know, I just, uh, I just want to comment. Uh, you know, nobody wants anything intrusive in their life, you know. <clears throat> but uh, we live, uh, we all live within a zone to the uh, largest and most polluting uh, electric power plant on the eastern seaboard. And we're all affected by it. I have asthma. All my grandkids have asthma. I bet all of you know people who have asthma. And it's not rocket science. Uh, you know, you burn coal and you uh, produce a tremendous amount of pollutants from burning coal. You add to climate change. Uh, you know, uh, I've been involved with uh, a little bit of wind power stuff, and you know, people's reaction is typical. Um, uh, the comment that one of you made earlier uh, to please go and stand under one of these things. I've been uh, to the one over in Portsmouth a hundred times, the big one. And the last time I was there, I got out of the car and I walked a hundred feet into the little meadow. And while I was walking over there, my cell phone rang, and it was blowing hard that day. And I stood under the wind turbine and I had a conversation on my cell phone. I could hear the other person, they could hear me, I could hear myself think. It's, it's within 200 feet of the high school, it's right near the basketball courts, uh, it's, it's not intrusive at all. And you know, um, I'm, I'm just trying to say that you know, we, we all talk about preserving the environment, we all talk about a renewable uh, economy that we want for the 21st century and I think if we're going to have an economy in the near future it's going to be based on stuff like this and then every time you try and build one of these people resist and and it's it's not and I'm not saying that you know there's no bait we all want a, a, a reasonable environment to live in but how do we build that economy and how do we build a renewable energy source 
if we if we get stopped every time. And I mean, Jim Gordon tried to put them between Martha's Vineyard, and you know what I mean. It was way out. You could barely see them, and people went crazy. So you can't build them out in the water. Now you can't build them anywhere on land. You know the moon is rented. You know I don't. Mean, I'm being a little facetious, but the the sound from a wind turbine is is truly to me. I mean, I can hear the cars on my street. I find that terribly intrusive. I live in Westport. Yeah, when I listen, I tried to build a wind turbine in Westport, my committee for for four years, and 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 it got stopped. And it's not going to happen. And no, no matter where you try, you know what I mean. So. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Well done. Steve, we have a question right here. I'd like to make a, a clarification on the Portsmouth, the larger Portsmouth uh, wind turbine. It's about the same size as the one you're proposing. The Portsmouth turbine, according to the town planner and another source, the uh, tip of the blade for this one would be 334, and Portsmouth is 336, just two feet difference. And actually, at the top of the hub of the one for BCC would be 240 feet, and Portsmouth is lower at 213 feet. So for all intents and purposes, in terms of visual uh, intrusion, this one would be the same as, as Portsmouth, from what the information I have. Um, the hub heights may be the same however the uh, the length of the blades are considerably different that turbine has I believe uh, is that a v82 that's an 82 meter diameter rotor this that we're proposing here is 54 meters but but in terms of the the, the tip of the blade the, the, they're about 336 of course um, it's 336 yours will be 334 about the same. I'd have to look into that because the, the math doesn't make sense on that if they're that similar. Because yeah. an 82, a V82 has 41 meter blades. Mm -hmm. And that, that math doesn't add up. Well, it's how planner sent me an email today and th that was what he said. And your hub is actually higher than Portsmouth. Theirs is 213, yours is 240. I think the difference is that in the one at Portsmouth, they have much longer blades. The reason why our, why our, mm. why our hub height is higher is because the wind was better at that level so that we could produce an appropriate amount of energy, not only for use by the school, but also for the payback necessary for the finance. So we had to It must be. By about, uh, By about uh, it's more than that. These are 70, uh, it's a 54 meter diameter, so that's 25 for the blade, so 25. So those are about 75 foot blades on this, or well, maybe 80 feet. And a V82 has blades that are about 125 feet long. But in terms of the height, they're the same. The very tip height, yes, but it looks very different. They look very different. If you put these two turbines together, you'd see the V82 has a very huge wingspan, and the turbine that we're proposing has a smaller wingspan. But it, but the the hub height is is taller. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question? Sure. H have you looked at other technologies that are less visually intrusive in terms of wind turbines? Are there new technologies coming along that would make more sense that would be less intrusive? I don't find them intrusive at all, so I, it's kind of a... Well, it is a, visually intrusive. A, I wonder if we could also look point, back so. at the slides which show the photomontage of how these uh, disturbers would look from a distance against the tree line. Um, from I, I can go out and I can take another picture from that intersection that's over here. However, the, the 
four houses that are the closest won't actually see it because of the vegetation in front of the houses. So I'd have to come to the to the close side of the intersection, and and I can do that. It's it's fairly simple to get it into the software and have it print that picture. The vegetation near the four houses and they're all near, so we could still. Um, I drove there tonight, and most of the vegetation is evergreen. Also, I'd like you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, I'd like you to consider that in this visual montage, as you said, in order for it to stand out, we actually show the uh, wind turbine as red. In reality, it would be white, which, if you think about it, would make it disappear into this background sky that you see. Consider its color would be almost the same as the building you see in the front of that photo, and this actual color against the sky. So it would tend to disappear. I don't think so. Could you show the other shot for the other side of the trees? And even that one in red, if it was white, it would look more like the branches of the trees without the leaves on it. It would tend to disappear and look like the abutments on that bridge that you see there. It would be less intrusive in its actual color. We have a question. You have a symbol of green energy in your front yard. It's it. Generally, I, I, I seriously though, I, I, I do love. Uh, I, Tony, let me yeah. just. Uh, Robert. Well, I think that this is the start of a change. We all going to benefit. Everybody is going to benefit from this because of the lack of air pollution that's in there. Well, you, it, there are many people that die due to the effects of power plants, and they've done Harvard's done studies, and and so. Yes. Oh, no. sorry. I didn't know that. <laughs> but even if I was another person in the audience and I have knowledge, that should still allow me to. I would gladly put one in my backyard. <laughs> if I could. You know, I've already looked into the into the process of putting And, and no, we, we appreciate the questions. We do. I want you to understand that you have to sell this project to us. Okay? And so I'm asking, I, I don't want to hear all this energy stuff. I know all about that. Everybody knows we have to do things. I want to know how is this, this is in my backyard. How is this going to benefit me? The tuition going to come down for me, students? Well, so you're, in the charge, you're in the highest tax areas in the city. Will we have our taxes? Come down as you're getting the advantage. What's going to be our advantage? One of the things that uh, we're trying to do, as I said through Executive Order 44, is to lower the financial burden on the state for buying energy for all of its properties. This, 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 this project alone may reduce that cost by 250000 with the number of projects that my pod of three project managers is currently working on, we have already projected 15 million per year in energy cost reductions. There are several pods in my office working on these projects. We may be up to as much as $30 million a year in energy cost reductions for the state. The more of these projects we do, whether they're for PVs, wind turbines, full comprehensives, the lower the state's burden is to buy energy. The, low, the more we can lower that burden, the better chance there is that taxes can remain stable because the state has to purchase less energy. This is one of the ideas of what we're trying to do is how do we lower uh, the state's uh, financial burdens? And one way we can do that is by using renewable energy resources 
that we can create the power instead of buying the power from utilities. This would hopefully can help stabilize the taxes that our citizens have to pay and, that, and the monies that we have to expend to keep our buildings operating. I know it's not, it may not seem like a great benefit yet, but over time, more and more renewable projects are going to have to happen if we're going to stabilize even the economy of this country. And Massachusetts is taking a lead, along with several other states, in trying to do this so that its citizens have to bear less burden financially. It may be distributed out amongst all of its citizens. This may seem small, but in the long run, the state will benefit by doing these kind of projects. I'd like to say I don't have a vested interest. I did get paid to be here, but th that doesn't, but I, I don't get production out of the turbine. Generally speaking, we have, the state has put together a list of a number of consultants that we use to do these projects. And we have them go out and tell us whether or not a project is feasible. If we determine after reviewing all the documentation coming in that a project is not feasible, that it will not produce enough energy to pay for itself. We don't go forward with a project. We wouldn't spend taxpayers' money on a project which just cannot support itself and provide some sort of benefit for the citizens who get to use the facility that has this project. It's a borderline project, which barely makes the criteria for doing it. Yet it does. Yet it does. <laughs> Yet it does. But borderline, well, that's why we have that's why we have evaluation criteria. Barely makes it, still makes it. Does it make it? Yes. So, you know, I've worked on projects that pay for themselves in three years. You know, I've also worked on projects that pay for themselves in 12 years. It, where's the cutoff? And, and, and who makes that evaluation of when is it economically feasible or not? That's not something that I can answer for my client. It's what I tell them is the payback. And then they determine if that's good enough for them. But what I, what I said in the beginning was if you were a wind developer and you had a wind site that was less than six meters per second, they would not fund the project. This isn't a wind developer that's putting this up. This is the college. This makes economic sense to them. It also must make economic sense to the state. Otherwise, we couldn't use the bond funds that are available to do the project. If it doesn't pay for itself, if, if we don't make 10% more energy than the cost to actually do the project, the state will not fund it. It will not occur. And that's why we review these studies and approve them before we even think about moving further down the line to try to make an actual project. We're trying to do something that benefits the state, but we will not put an undue burden which cannot be paid back for the money that the state, that the citizens of the state are putting forward through their taxes that help fund these projects. So we just will not proceed if there's not a financial benefit and a payback to the state. If the state cannot be paid back for the project, the project will not happen. It may be seemingly marginal, which is why the tower is taller than it normally would be by about 20 or so meters because the wind at that higher level makes the project more feasible. So we had to do a taller project, even though the blades are smaller. Consider it the width of a tangerine compared to a width of a grapefruit. That's the size of the blades we're using compared to the size of the blades from, from the Portsmouth. So uh, you, it will be less obtrusive visually. It just has to be taller to catch the wind that's at that level. Seems to me a lot of your data No, the wind is what it is. That's why we put up, you remember the Met Tower that was up for a year? So what we do is we measure the wind data for a year. We take that and we take another data set from a, from a location that's similar to this site. And I forget what we used for this site, but the correlation was very high. 
We correlate those two data sets together. We take 20 years of past data and we bring it to the same evaluation as the Met Tower. And then we project that for 20 years. So that, the only data that we get from the manufacturer are their ICE certified uh, power curves. That's, so every wind speed that, they, that you evaluate, they give you a power at that wind speed. So we take that frequency distribution from the 20 years and we multiply it by their power curve. And that's a certified power curve. They have to stand by it. So that's the only data we, we use from them. Yeah. Is the feasibility study available online from you? Uh, no, it is not. Not at this time. Student college I, I think it, study yeah, online. it's on the college website. Yeah, it's on the college website. Hi, my, na my name is Paul and I'm an independent homeowner. I put up a windmill that I constructed myself that is probably three times louder than what you're going to put up in the middle of the south end of New Bedford. Not one person that lived from here to there ever complained. They always told me they liked it because they could see the way the wind was blowing. I made a statement to the oil companies. I am not going to put up with these high prices anymore. I'm not. I'm going to do something like this college is going to do something and say we are going to create our own energy and you're going to start paying us back. So what does it do for the homeowners? It, it stops peak oil and prices and everything else. They're getting scared of seeing this technology. People that are fighting this technology are the big oil companies. They don't want to see a windmill in your backyard. They don't want to see hydrogen. They don't want to see anything. They just want the dollars in their pockets. I don't think there's anything wrong with a windmill in your yard. I never had a complaint except for the city when they found out after six years I didn't have a permit to put it up there. <laughs> and then I took it down. <laughs> but now I've built another one that's going to go 18 feet, the legal limit, where they cannot tell me to take it down. It's going to be vertical design. It's not going to be as efficient as yours. But it will produce something all the time. I have one on my boat. I have one at my house, they work. Thank you. I live right over here. And I'll be saying, Yeah, it won't fit over there because of the property line constraints. It needs to, it, it has to be a certain setback oh, from. It, it needs to be, it, it needs to be away from property lines. That, that location over there, those, those, those parking lots touch the, well, they don't touch the property line. They're very close, but it, it has to be a minimum of 300 feet from the property line. So the only place we can fit it is over here. And they can still use it. I ask you, why is that not usable anymore after we put a wind turbine there? Well, I mean, that's the place people go, have a nice quiet walk. Now they're going to have monstrosity. I, I, I really would ask you to go and stand underneath one of these turbines because I, you saying that they won't be able to concentrate and, and they won't be able to enjoy the land anymore, I, I just I can't believe it, especially when Mass Maritime Academy and Hull both have them on their ball fields. Yeah, but the, the, the Mass Maritime one is adjacent to the, to the baseball diamond. That's a 600. That's a 600 kilowatt. I just want to mention one thing about Hull. Hull built one, and it worked so well, and they liked it so much that they built a second one on there. So now they have two large wind turbines. Do have a question back yeah. here? I, I would just like to uh, say that I can really um, empathize with people's concerns about visibility, about noise, and so forth. But I think one of the key things we have to remember is that we are in a changing period of time. 
we are facing very serious energy shortages coming in the not so distant future and we need to find alternative ways that are renewable when we look at oil when we look at gas when we look at coal these are all finite non-renewable sources of energy which we have benefited from for 150 close to 200 years now but that period of time is coming to an end and we have to seriously think about how are we going to energize, how are we going to power our homes, our vehicles, our places of work, our schools. And this is a major effort that becomes an example, not only for other colleges and universities, but for the community at large of an effort to find ways of energizing and using the power that we can have through renewable energy. You know, we've had a long, long ride with fossil fuels, but that's coming to an end. It's one of the reasons why the cost of all the fossil fuels are going up within the next few years. We already see it with oil. It's going to happen with natural gas, and it's going to happen with uh, nuclear as well, as well as coal. We have to change the way we think, and we have to change the way we do things, and this is an effort toward that. I'm here to, as an, just an interested, interested observer trying to uh, just understand it. But the bottom line I'd like to ask about, if the college decides to go forward with this, can they do this as a matter of right, or would there be a permitting process or a variance needed, or um, can, you, can you just go ahead and do it, or will there be a permitting process? Because of the location of the turbine, it will require uh, local permitting from the Conservation Commission. Um, it will also require permitting through the Mass Historic Commission. Um, and I believe that that may be all the permits that it's going to actually require. And then it's also going to require a building permit, a state-issued building permit. Right, but it does not interfere with the zoning at all? It, uh, it wouldn't come up for uh, variance or anything like that. It is a no, permitted is, use within this. There's two reasons why the answer to that is no. One mm -hmm. is it's state property, and the second is it's a school at, uh, under the Dover Amendment. Okay. So it, it does not go to zoning, right. local zoning. Thank you. I understand that the life cycle for one of these turbines is about 25 years, is that right? That's correct. Um, what happens at the end of the 25 years? Uh, if there's new technology that is less visually intrusive, is there a likelihood that that would replace, and more efficient, would that replace uh, this turbine, or is that thinking too far ahead? No, it's not thinking too far ahead. It's a actually very good question. The, the tower sections for the turbine are built to last 50 plus years. Uh, so what will typically happen is, at the end of 20 years, we'll see what the technology is. If it's going to be a simple retrofit of the um, of the generator, then you know we would bring in equipment to replace the generator. Or it may be that technology has become so far advanced that we'll actually be taking the entire nacelle off and putting something else on top of the tower, which is, would be structurally sound enough to handle something of similar size or smaller. You're giving everybody all these explanations. We're all from a neighborhood here, I assume the majority. What's the advantage to us other than to you? Because we're all for renewable energy, but how's it gonna, you're putting it in our neighborhood. How's it going to help us? The renewable aspects of it are, are everybody's benefit. Uh, if you're looking Excuse for, and, and I just gotta throw it out here, I, I don't know what you're looking for. For, for a benefit from it, besides, you know, having something that, excuse me? Is that, is that neighborhood going to save $250,000 on energy costs? No. Okay. Well, I'll call for you, right? Yeah, right. No. It hasn't affected mine, so. 
No. How do you feel when they withhold the no neighborhood. There was no neighborhood here. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I was involved in a campaign to get the, the local power plants to clean up, and one of them actually closed because it wasn't making any money, and, uh, you know, burning coal is a... Uh, something that was a big deal 100 years ago, and it's getting, you know, and I mean, uh, the destructiveness of it is beginning to be recognized by everyone. All of our health is affected. Everybody sitting in this room, our health is affected by Brayton Point. And they're not volunteering to pay for the health care of your children or your grandchildren. And believe me, the people in this area, like 350,000 asthma cases between uh, New Bedford and Newport. I forget the exact numbers, but somebody referenced the Harvard Medical Study. All of our health is affected by Brayton Point, by the burning of coal to produce electricity. They're not, they're not offering anything. You know, this is a pushback, as this gentleman m m mentioned, against that. What we all get is better health. Is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of electricity that doesn't have to be produced by the burning of coal. And one, and I'll say it again: if we're going to have a renewable economy, if we're going to have an economy, where the heck does it start? If everybody everywhere, and trust me, everybody says the same thing. I'm all for the environment. I'm all for renewable. Just not here. You put here and here and here and not here and not here all together. You know what you got? Nowhere. I just want to just make a comment to that. Uh, you know, you're all saying that uh, you know wind power, renewable energy. You, you're not, you, you know, never will generate enough electricity by having the windmills. You would have to have a windmill on everybody's property here, and the whole Fall River would have to be full of windmills. It's not feasible. Okay, but anyways. It, th th that's not here nor there. That's over there. It's going to stay there forever. No breathing. Well, I understand that. That's a danger. The problem is that renewable energy, the wind is fine. Geothermal energy is fine. Let's put solar panels out. Let's do all that. You know what? Economically, it's not going to work. Its paybacks are not there. Long time. Up in the north here, we can't do that. If we could, there would be people out there building them like crazy but the economics just don't support it. So thank you for doing this. It's a good attempt. I'm not opposed to it, but just please answer the questions on how we are going to benefit from this, the residents. That's all we want to know. I'd like to address one of your comments about um, you said that economically they don't make money, and you couldn't be more wrong. There are companies out there that are installing wind turbines because they make them money. Now, another thing that I need you to, that I spoke about earlier that, that you need to remember is Massachusetts set a renewable portfolio standards where 20% of the amount of electricity distributed needs to come from renewable resources in Massachusetts. They can't buy compliance recs from other states. They have to come from Massachusetts. These, these renewable resources need to be installed in this state for us to, for, for that mandate to be met. It's a requirement. They can't, it's, a feel good thing. It's, a feel good it's not a feel good thing, thing. It's, a, it's, gas, it's a health thing. thing. would be building windmills. I looked at building a windmill in my yard. The payback was 100 years. That's because you're not putting a commercial scale was, one well, in. Well, that, well, that's right. If, if, if the electric companies saw a benefit in this, don't you think they would be doing it? They'd be building it in Texas, in the wind turbine area of Texas. If They're Texas were a nation, if Texas were a nation, it would be the sixth 
largest producer of renewable energy in the world. Build it there. They do build them there a lot. They're not building them like, they're not, it's not, I guess go ahead and build it, it's okay. I just don't think that it's going to be beneficial in the long run. The thing's gonna close down and, and it's gonna be economically, $250,000 a drop and a half. What's the budget for the college? 60 million. 60 million? $250,000, it's nothing. Well, 250000 to me is quite a bit. <laughs> I can see statewide you know? when the state, the state wants to have a good initiative. The state wants to make everybody feel good. But guess what? You're not making us feel good. You're not making the residents here feel good. You haven't answered the questions. If you can say that my house is not going to drop in value because of this, fine. If, it's, if I hear it will, then that's a problem. But you haven't addressed that situation. You, you know, what... The noise situation from the college, you haven't convinced me that that noise that I hear all the time, that low hum 24 hours a day, is going to be worse than that. So, again, the property you've done value a good job of, of, of doing this thing, but you haven't done a good job of convincing this group here. These people already know what they want to do, these people over here, you haven't convinced us. And they're putting a windmill up. I, I didn't do UMass Dartmouth, so I, I don't know. Put in the state forest, see how many people complain. That's the story. Put it up there. How many people come out of the woodwork saying, we can't have it there? That's the point. Everywhere. I agree with you. Everywhere. Where do you go? One of the things back in uh, 1977. Jimmy Carter made a speech to the nation saying that we have to change our energy sources and that we have to move to renewable energy. And he put solar panels and uh, he put uh, solar thermal on the roof of the White House. And he, but that's because Reagan tore them off and said that Americans will never have to sacrifice and they're in, actually in a museum in China, and people laugh at us for putting them there. You know, when when they go into there, so it's. No. China's making sixty percent of the solar panels in the world. Ten years ago, they made eight percent. And I think if your health is not a benefit, you don't consider your health a benefit? Well, that's... Yes. Yeah? Uh, yes, there is a syndrome. Uh, any... any I'm going to try to be as uh, as open about this as I can and, and non-biased. Um, any any group of symptoms can be construed as a syndrome. This has been one doctor who has put together this wind syndrome thing, and it's been debunked by many doctors, and I don't want to get into the debate about who's right or who's wrong. What I will tell you is the Department of, of uh, Environmental Protection has put together a panel of experts to look at this wind turbine syndrome. Um, the scale of turbines that contribute to this so-called syndrome are large commercial scale, 1.5 megawatts and greater that have the 125 foot blades. This is not in that same kind of category. That we will not have any of, this, uh, any of these effects similar to large turbines. No, and, and, and look, look, uh, the property values thing has been looked at time and time again. And the empirical data by 
Uh, the author was Ben Hohen from Berkeley uh, Lawrence Labs. And the empirical data... He looked at this site. No, he didn't look at this site. It's a, it's a study. It's a study of, of, of houses built around turbines. And there's no empirical evidence that the sale of houses or the value of houses are impacted by, by being in the viewshed of turbines. That's all I can report on then I would ask the expert to go out and get empirical data which states differently. That's all I can do is report on, on the facts. I can't make promises that, that, aren't, um, that aren't tangible. I, I can only... Once this thing is up and running, this is not okay? And if we don't solve these issues prior to it going up, then it's, you know, keep you by the door, you know, it's over. Have you selected a manufacturer yet? Yes, EWT. Can you come here, give a presentation? I mean, you're telling us what the noise levels are. I'd like to hear from somebody who actually built this. I, I, you would have to ask the college. You can't ask me if I'm going to put on a presentation. I, I don't know. You know, BCC's already been a good name. I've lived over here for 12 years. Mm -hmm. I first came here, campus police came to my house. We see up there in the parking lot. Them know if he sees anything. They're great neighbors. I think kind of throwing this at us, we should have been on this in the beginning. This is not the beginning. This is this, this horse is out of the box. We knew a year ago when we did the wind study. Yeah, but I thought it was going to be down there. Uh, you did it down the there. It's going to be at the college. I, I still think that is, is there a specific question from the manufacturer that you would like answered? Well, I just I didn't know you had. Yes. It, it goes out. Are you going to take the cheapest one? No. No. The, the turbine has to be from the manufacturer selected. The, the bids would be for construction. It's not for procurement of the turbine. The, the turbine, the, the one selected was selected because of the size, because of the, the small nature of the blades and because of the acoustical, uh, uh, the, the certified acousticals that come with the turbine. And we've done every effort to find a turbine that would be responsible for this location and responsible to the residents. Your concerns are not the first that I've heard on this project. Your concerns were voiced from Leo Racine were Leo Racine and Steve Kenyon the first day that I met with them and Deborah Ventress who is no longer with, with the college. Live there, right? Well, Leo lives in town, doesn't he? Well, yeah. He doesn't live around here. I, I, no, he doesn't live around here. So your concerns have always been forefront. We came to the college and said, we're thinking about a 1.5 megawatt turbine that's going to be 400 feet tall. And it, they said, no way, no way. It's, that, that, is, that is absolutely not going to happen. We ran the acoustics on it. We found that we'd have to be shutting it down. We found that it was going to exceed the DEP noise standards. So we scrapped that project. We found a, a different turbine. We scaled back in size on the project. Excuse me? Where's the CMR for the noise uh, standard? 310 CMR 7. Uh, the Massachusetts State one? Yeah. It's under the air. It's under air quality, actually. Uh, that would be DHUC policy 90-001. It's a policy, not a CMR? It's also a CMR. No, it is a CMR. It's the same one as in the CMR. It's the, the, I, how, I how, about, how high above the uh, 10? It, it's rated at 10? 10 decibels. 10 above, decibel. above ambient is the legal limit. And we are how high? 
Uh, probably speaking from a practical standpoint, you're probably not going to be much, in most cases, you're not going to be very much above it at all. Because the weather, because the, the sound from 24 is high enough to work through the upper 30s and low 40s, the same level of turbulence most of the time. The very worst case, that will be late at night when you're downwind of the turbines, which is not going to happen is when to turn them off. But the very worst case, you'd probably be at eight, maybe eight to nine. You'd be close. But that isn't going to happen because we've already decided not to run this. So, so it's going to be eight to nine. So it's close to the, is it MCL or they call it? The, the, the limit? Well, it's close to, it's, it, it would be close to the limit if we were running them then. In fact, okay. but since we're not going to run them then, it's not even going to be even close. Because right. when I look at the, the, the quiet and the noisiest times, I looked at all the rest of the time, right? Besides yeah. those hours, there was yeah. nothing below 36 decibels any other time. It was, so in other words, it wouldn't be even more than five decibels above the worst case the rest of the time. Even that would be very rare. Yeah. So very more than likely, it's going to be about the same as what you're hearing on 24, maybe a little bit more, but not much. But you, you don't know what the decibel reading of this noise is coming from the building next door, do you? Uh, I haven't measured it, no. Could that be measured? You, you did measure it because it's a, the, the sound that he's talking about is in the middle of the night. That that shows up as your as your ambient. Whatever it was, I wasn't sitting out there one morning listening to it. But it was whatever what late at night the traffic on twenty four as everybody knows it gets a little bit more intermittent, right? So basically the background level there's two levels we measure. It's the average level, right? And then there's the background level which is the, the, the called the L ninety, and that's the sound which is exceeded 90% of the time. So 990 is what you hear when it isn't traffic. So the very worst case is that we uh, measure the usual whatever it was coming from the city the university. Because the prevailing winds is right towards our house. Uh, That's where it is. Uh, I, mean, I ten, guarantee you can live it out there. 10 o'clock in the morning, breeze comes up. And 10 o'clock in the morning, you can hear the noise of the college. Like, you can almost hear people talk. Well, I, I actually like to make one statement about the noise levels as well, about uh, the, the noise of the We measured, uh, we did not actually have wind blowing from Route 24. No, it doesn't go to cut the street. That's right. And, and, and though it doesn't do it very often, I'm saying the worst case is when the residents of college heights are downwind. So, in fact, during times when the, college, the residents of college heights would be downwind, Sounds also going to be blowing in from Route 24, so the whole background is going to be higher. So we were very concerned about the background. The actual background, you're going to hear when you're down wind from Route 24 or during the typical operation, is going to be a lot higher than what we measured. So we were, we were this is the worst case, the middle of the night in the winter. During the summer, you're looking at insect noise, leaf crossing, it's going to be a lot. Well, to, to your advantage, the prevailing wind That's right. right up this way, and so the noise is going to be. On the north side. That's where, the, that's where we want to get. That's where we want to get. We want that's to go that way, not to go to towards the rest of us. That's where we want to go. What's that? I mean, we wait for a public hearing. Is that what it is? Do this for the city? We express our concern for the city? Um, what's next is uh, DCAM is looking at um, looking into further feasibility for actually site design. Um, can a foundation actually be constructed and, and des well designed and constructed? Um, interconnection, uh, there are there may be some potential um, routes that we have to look at for interconnection. Also, you have to file a permit with National Grid. It takes a long time uh, for them to be able to evaluate the the, uh, the turbine that you're proposing, and they have to tell you that you're able to connect it to the grid or not. How are you going to get the wires? Are you going to go around the pond? That's being looked at uh, within the next two months. We're going to try to figure out how we would be connecting it. But, yes, it would likely follow the, the path that's already there. Uh, out to the pond. It would be underground. The, no, just like I said before, the, there is permitting, so we, we have to go. We have to go through uh, conservation commission for work in the buffer zone. And speaking of uh, wildlife, what about the wildlife? Uh, how the birds and the ducks and the geese going to be affected by this this thing that's 
340 feet in the air now. I've got a couple of beautiful mallards that come over there every summer, okay? Are they going to get chased away? Uh, the 40 or 50 uh, different species of birds that feed in his backyard, okay, and the bird feeders, are they going to get chased away? Um, we've got hawks, we've got the owls, we've got an abundance of wildlife in this area that you people wouldn't know about. No, but we, we did do we did do studies for bat and avian, and it, it was determined that there would probably be one strike per year. Um, the, How did you determine that? Uh, local ornithologists contribute to the report. We yeah, look at his that we it's in it's in the feasibility study. So that would be on the website. Yes. That's on the website. But that's a big issue too, as far as I'm concerned. Part of the joy of living down here is enjoying the wildlife that does roam around here. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit of it. Considering this is Fall River, it's an urban area, we're very fortunate to have this little piece of, of heaven over here. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to be chasing away all the wildlife. This it, it That's won't. another issue. Mm -hmm. How many acres would you have to clear? Um, there would be minimal clearing in the area of the turbine. Uh, Acres, not acres. We're talking, you know, um, maybe a quarter of an acre. That would be maintained by the colony? Yes. Who would maintain the, uh, the turbine? Uh, contractors? Subcontractors? Uh, that would be determined by DCAM, who's going to operate and maintain it. But typically, it's either the contractor goes for a week long. Um, performance training with the manufacturer or the manufacturer sends people out themselves. We have several options on that. Sometimes we have in our RFPs and our contracts that the contractor has to uh, offer to the college a five-year maintenance plan to maintain it. The college can take that option or it also can have its own personnel trained in how to operate it. Uh, typically these things are connected electronically to the uh, energy management system, building management system of the college. If there is a problem, it'll show up right away on a computer and they can arrange to take care of that maintenance almost immediately because it'll show up so quickly that if there's on a maintenance contract, then that the contract or maintenance company, which is familiar with this type of wind turbine, will come out within 24 hours or less and take care of the issue. So there's not gonna be a problem of how well it's maintained or that is producing the type of energy we expected to get from the turbine. What is the annual maintenance cost? Uh, that'll be determined by the proposals that we get from the contractors. It varies depending on the companies that they're using, that how so their familiar, familiarity. Uh, that can vary. We've had it vary uh, on a number of different projects. I'm trying to remember what we recently had and it may be somewhere between two, I'd say about 5,000 a year. Is there gonna be a light on it? Yes, there is a red light that typically is on top of it, and that's for FAA requirements. We can talk about a light now. Well, we can pull our shades down. Are blinking? We'll have our I have to go back and, and look at the uh, FAA determination, but typically what's required is a low intensity red blinking. On each propeller? No, it's just at the hub height. It's um, just at the hub itself. They do have planes flying over there a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the, when, we, when we do a feasibility study, we take a look at the FAA sighting criteria tool and then it tells us if we need to file or not. We filed with them, we got a determination of no, uh, no hazard. Um, on that determination no hazard also has a ruling as to, you know, do you need the, the red blinking light, the high intensity white. Um, but I, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's the low intensity red. And I, I can find that right now, so. How far away would you be able to see that? Can you see that? across the city or, uh, you know, from um, Somerset or something, you'll be able to see it? I, I, I don't know how long, how far you can see the, the red light for. It's a... Oh, well, even the, the, it's for pilots, not for the uh, turbine itself. Oh, how, how far will you be able to see the yeah. turbine? Yeah. Um, 
And we can see those towers, you know, that they mm -hmm. uh, Oh, it's, it's not as tall as a radio tower. It's uh, it, it, as tall as the one down the street? How tall, I don't know how tall that one is. I believe it's 83 meters. Oh, okay. Uh, President Ave. Mm -hmm. I believe it's 83 meters. That's 83 down the street? I, I believe. I think it's in your study. And, and this one's going to be what? Uh, the hub of this one, the the middle of it, is at 75 meters. So it'd be about as high as that tower down in the street, right? Approximately. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, it's about the same as that tower down in the street, right? Yes. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, I, I still have. What does the college want to say to us? Nothing. <laughs> Convince us. <laughs> Convince us. I'm, you know, I'm convincible. Somebody has to convince me that this is a wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, actually, I just read the... Sell us. Be a car salesman. The determination of no hazard to air navigation. You, you'll be happy to hear this okay. one. Yeah, so let me finish the one that's okay. right. Um, actually, it says right in the study, based on this evaluation, marking and lighting are not necessary for aviation safety. So it will not have the the red low intensity blinking light on it. It won't have any lights on it. Oh, okay. I can answer that. Sure. Now, there have been a number of questions about what do you get out of it, okay? So I want to uh, point out what I said at the beginning, uh, and that is that the role of higher education, two parts here. First, in, with sustainability. First, to make available the research and to make people aware of uh, what's going on in our planet. There is no doubt, so I, about this uh, higher education uh, uh, research, there is no doubt about global warming, okay? There is no doubt about it. Uh, you may hear someone say, well, it's still up for grabs. It's not up for grabs. There's no doubt about global warming happening. The second thing is, as you heard from now, Dr. Nancy Lee Wood, who's the head of our institute, we are in an age of peak oil. It means we've already hit the highest level of oil, and from now on, we're drawing on our savings account. So the, da the data is there that we must do something. And someone snickered when someone said, well, we might all have windmills. We, we might well have to do it. Dr. Wood is already at the point um, uh, far away from us, I mean, far ahead of us, in that we need, uh, trucks, uh, we're going to have to have victory gardens in our homes, uh, and those windmills are uh, some power source you're going to have to find. So the second part, not only the data and the research for higher education, but the second role of higher education is to model uh, the effect of the research. We are putting it up. We can't put it up in your, your we're getting money for it. Now, if you want me to come and give you each $250,000, then I don't think that's realistic. We're saving money. It's paying for itself. I mean, I, I just cannot abide by anybody questioning the the expertise that has been uh, brought to this project, and it's all under the umbrella of DCAM. Jonathan and Howard are absolute experts in this field. They don't have a stake in this, and uh, you know, if we brought in someone wanted to bring in another observer, we'd have to pay that observer, and then you say, well, you're just being paid. DCAM is, I mean, they take care of all our buildings and all of uh, all construction projects in the state. If they don't have integrity, then the state is, is uh, you know, in a great deal of trouble. But of course, they do have integrity. This has been a powerful study. You've heard from learned experts about it. So we are modeling, that's the second part of our role of higher education. We are modeling how to go about doing this. We have an organic garden that you heard me talk about. We had beehives uh, uh, and honey. We didn't sell the honey, but we had that. I mean, and so this is, this is, according to Dr. Wood, I mean, this is the future, and we're in for a shock uh, when you can't go to a Stop and Shop or, or a Dave's or anywhere else to buy your vegetables. You've got, there's no trucks, there's no gas to provide that. Uh, that I mean, that's a real horrendous, uh, I'm not there yet, but that's a horrendous scenario. She's been there for years, uh, warning us at the college about it, and now she's on a national platform about it. So. Uh, what you get out of it is to see someone doing something, taking the initiative, and making it work for sustainability. 
not only this project, but all of the other things that we do and all of the other things that we're going to do. In the 25 years that the, of the life cycle of this particular project, uh, what, who knows what the technology, we just think 25 years ago. You wouldn't recognize America uh, today, would you? I mean, it, it is, uh, it, the technology 25 years from now is gonna take care of itself, not only, not only by, um, by uh, design, or, or not, I'm sorry, not only by accident, but by design, because we're, we're 25 years from now, we may well be facing what Dr. Wood has been talking about. And you have in your neighborhood, and I thank someone who said that it, we're, we try to be good neighbors at all times. You have in your neighborhood a neighbor, a good neighbor, showing you what the future is coming to be. And uh, if you don't like it, then I'm sorry. But uh, uh, we've all got to take sustainability measures. Whether you start uh, gently in a low flush toilet at your house or whatever it is. Someone said they looked into building a windmill. What were the neighbors going to say if the windmill turned out to be cost effective? It's too high. It's this, it's that. So I'm sorry to, uh, to play this, but you've, you've asked a hundred times, what do you get out of it? And what you get out of it is the benefit of what we're doing for the community. And I want you to, uh, you know, uh, uh, take notice and we'll be held accountable. Those studies are on the web. We have nothing to hide. This is data. That's the research that higher education does. And uh, take advantage of that research for your own. You can't put up a, a million dollar uh, uh, turbine. I get that. But you can do something in your home. And when you see Bristol Community College doing these little things as well as big things, then I think we're modeling good behavior for the community, not just the people who live nearby, of them too, of course, but the whole community that we serve, all of Bristol County. Everybody knows that, uh, you know, that's, that's our service area and that's what we do. So I hope that that helps to answer your question. It's not going to be, I'm not going to, you know, uh, say that it's exactly what you were looking for. We're going to give you, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, for, uh, uh, for what, putting up with our good work. Uh, so we're going to try to be good neighbors, continue to be good neighbors. And, uh, you know, I, uh, we're open, we're, uh, we're accessible. We want to have this uh, project work and we want it to be accepted by the neighborhood. And then we want it uh, to be of value for the neighborhood. When you say value, what value is there? And green energy is not what green energy was originally, uh, the image was cast. So I think that was be over exaggerated. Uh, I, I think our vice, previous vice president started it and it went out of shape. But green energy has not been proven to be what you're stating it to be. Well, I mean, that's, you know, I can't, uh, I can't persuade you of the data. You know, yeah, we, we present the data and you have to make your own uh, uh, decisions. I guess we just don't want to make sure that, is my myself, the property values don't go down. Because sure. That. And, and you've... It's, it's hard enough now, you understand. Yeah, of course. The property values are yeah. dropping anyways. So if somebody comes in and puts a windmill out there mm -hmm. and says, hey, I'm not going to buy that house because there's a windmill there. Yeah. That impacts me. Directly. But isn't there someone that might buy it because it's there? I mean, there, we've heard from people that there's, there's no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're taking the assumption that it does impact real estate values. There's no empirical evidence about that. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm not saying it does. But we have to go on the best. Can you provide that? Can you? It was, it was. Yeah, actually, he said there, there, there were some studies, but not necessarily. And it's going to be based on noise. Right? Uh, Lawrence Livermore is looking at that right now because it's the, it's the question everybody wants answered. And I, you're not the first person to answer the question. I want to know the answer too because I, you know, I, I want to say that you know, in, in, the, in the event that it's proven that there is reduction of value, certainly I, I certainly believe that people who, who suffer diminution of value should be compensated for. I mean, that's the fair thing to do. And I think, you know, in, in certain extreme cases, I think it's been shown that it may happen. Um, in this particular case, well, I have a quick question. Who here lives on College Heights? Is anybody? You do? Okay, so you do. All you know, you're, you're people on the four houses of College Heights. Okay, so that would be the only, basically our conclusion was that was the only area that would even be affected at all. So I'm talking to all the people who, yeah, okay, you're them. Good, I'm glad you're all here. Okay, so in terms of the question of diminution of value due to noise close in, okay, uh, 
they're going to, the, the study is due out probably in, around next year sometime. It's, uh, I can give some people, you can give me an email address, I'll send you the person to contact. Everybody wants to see what they're going to come up with. And certainly, you know, since there's only very few residents involved here, certainly if, if it's something that could be proven, it may be a possibility. I, I, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but you may want to approach the university about it. If you can prove that it is a, a legitimate issue, then, you know, it would be something that you could discuss with them, um, you know, as, as part of fair compensation. It's not out of the question. Because the, the amount involved here, the extreme cases that I have heard of, and that's just anecdotal evidence, is about maybe 20%. It's a possibility it could go down that much. Now, I don't think, I, I've been on College Avenue. I don't think the houses there are worth, I mean, you know, I, they're certainly not worth half a million, are they? I don't think, no. they're, they're not even close to that. So the actual total amount, if each of the house, four houses on College Avenue had about 20% diminution of value, you're looking at maybe a total loss of value of, at the very, very, very worst, which I don't think would happen, would be about 100000 that sound right, about right? And that would be that would be the, that was assuming that it was the very worst case, and I think that's extreme. Given the kind of term we're putting in here, the kind of noise levels we're going to be having, I think that's extremely unlikely that it would be anything close to that. But certainly, if it were provable, in other words, if you could come up with the evidence, will be there in about a year or so. And certainly, if if, if it's proven that it is, a, a, if you prove it's a legitimate concern that you may want to discuss it with the university. It, it's because the amount involved is not, relative to the amount of the wind turbines, the amount involved in, in compensation is, is very low. I mean, it's only four residents. The, the amount involved would not be a, far, a huge amount. And you guys five, can, you can prove residents. it to them. It's, it's legitimate. It's five residents. Five houses. That's right. I'm sorry. Five. My mistake. Yeah. So, but, yeah. Okay. All right. And, but the whole point of it all is it's a relatively low number of houses. They're near the university. Uh, the very worst case, I could it would be about 100, I'm guessing, and I'm, I doubt even then it would be anywhere close to that if it were any, if it were anything at all. But the, the amounts involved are such that compared to the overall cost of the project and the overall cost of the university, it's certainly a possibility that you could discuss it with the university mm -hmm. to have some kind of arrangement. We could talk about refunds if your values go up because you're in a green neighborhood. <laughs> How about that? Well, I think we're kind of getting close to the end. I want to thank uh, Jonathan and Howard and the two Tonys. Uh, Tony, did you have any final uh, comments that you'd like to make? I thank you all for coming. Are it's a controversial topic. To well, I, um, I don't know what the next plan is. Uh, Tony, do you? Uh, um, I think there's still a lot on answers. No, I think we've answered all your questions and uh, you, some of the answers you don't like, but there's no sense having another round, I don't think. <laughs>